Great. Great. Thank you guys for being here and, and uh, appreciate the, the drive. Was Watonga that far away? Have you driven further? Well, we've been to Cleo Springs. Okay. In the last couple of months. So great. great. So this was like in your backyard then from, from Cleo Springs. Yeah. Hey, uh, would you mind just praying with me um, before we dismiss our kids to go to uh, their Christmas play practice? God, we thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, and, and we eagerly wait for you to do something new. Um, Lord, I pray uh, today that, uh, that you use this servant, me, God. I pray that you... Uh, I pray that you uh, maybe make word fresh, that you make it new, and I pray that it's a blessing to our understanding, Lord. But Lord, some of us might come with little or lack of hope today, Lord. So uh, God, I, I pray that you show up in a mighty way, that you speak to those, um, that you have made provisions for people to be here today, and I pray that it's a, a blessing for them to, to be here and that, that they would not leave the same that we would leave transformed more into your image, God. And so, God, we just uh, give this service to you, and we love you today, and all God's people said, amen. Okay, kids, if you would like to go to your Christmas play, play practice, you guys are free to go. We good. So Jimmy was uh, preaching Thursday, Thursday night, and uh, I'm sitting in the back row, and he uses this uh, passage of scripture from Mark chapter 13. His, uh, his message was about this whole looking forward to end times, and there are certain things that end up happening in the end times that seem to be pretty scary. And so I, I marked it um, because there is certain language in there that is familiar to me, and, and I'm appreciative of a singing group that comes and, and sparks some thoughts, okay? Um, sparks some imagination, because I believe that there's some imagination even in song. Um, here, I don't, I'm just going to read just a short um, verse found in Mark chapter 13, and it has nothing to do, <laughs> has nothing to do with the sermon today, but it has everything to do with a song that it reminded me of, okay? Uh, Psalms, I'm sorry, uh, Mark 13 verse 24 says, but in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its life, the dark will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. It kind of sparked this, this thought in my mind about a, a song. Uh, it's an old song. I'm not sure of, if I, I'm, I'm not great with names. Um, if, if you're new to the Watonga Church of the Nazarene, um, I, I have a hard time, unless that I put you in a context or if we have uh, lunch together or something like that, I have a hard time with names. But I forget the person that, that, that wrote and sang this song. Um, but it sparked a, a, a thought. And I want you to do this imagination with me, okay? It's an old song. Way before my time, okay? But that doesn't mean anything for some of you, okay? Some of you, it, it probably sparks a certain memory, okay? And so I want you just to talk back to me. Whenever I reveal what this song is, I want you to tell me what it reminds you of, okay? The song goes like this. When the night has come and the land gets dark and the moon is the only light we'll see. No, I won't be afraid. No, I won't be afraid just as long as you stand, stand by me. Okay? That's what that scripture reminded me of. I, I went back to Carrie. I said, Carrie, is that not the Stand By Me song? And he says, uh, it's a little, it's, it reminds me a little bit about that. But the second verse, the second verse, as I dove more into it, the second verse of this song is actually taken from a gospel song in which that they read Psalm 46, and, it, and it's this. If the sky that we look upon should tumble and fall, or the mountains should crumble to the sea, now that's scary imagery, 
I won't cry, I won't cry, no, I won't shed a tear just as long as you stand. Stand by me. Now, I was hoping that uh, Dr. Betts would come up there whenever I was reading. I, I imagine knowing them going to be here and knowing that I was going to read these lyrics, I thought that he was just going to slowly move to the piano and he was going to go boom, boom, boom. Boom, 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 boom. So you guys know the song, right? Are you familiar with the song? I was going to sing it, but then I realized what company I was in with, and I was just saying, no, I, I won't cry. I won't be afraid. <laughs> um, anyway, where were you? What does that remind you of? Anything at all? Does it, it not take? Does it take you somewhere? Does that song "Stand by Me" take you somewhere? Anybody willing to share? I'm, the movies? The movie "Stand by Me"? Yeah. I was on a 45, and I was up at my mom and dad's house when they were building it. We had these 45 albums up there. Uh huh. I was playing that song back in the later, early before. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You, you put yourself out there, Bob, and I'm very appreciative of it. I, I mean, uh, I, I really do. I, I appreciate that. Anybody else want to share? All right, Brad. I used to sing, this is one of two or three songs that I used to sing to my kids when they were little when I was rocking. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, anybody else willing to share that? Thank you, Brad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good clown music when I was a kid in high school. I mean, KOMA on radio. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know why. I think that's. I think I'm out of context. The reason why, I, and this is probably the second time that I've used this mo movie as a as a point of reference, and it's Ghost again. The movie Ghost. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, I, and I only watched that movie once, and my, my dad set us down to watch that. And you know, whenever you, I don't know if some of you that has ever watched that classic movie, there is an awkward scene in there, and to be watching it with your dad, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of awkward. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I don't know if that was actually in that movie or, or not, uh, but I'm thinking, probably thinking of another song uh, that is kind of the reference point. But it was originally written f as a gospel, um, and it was ri originally directed towards the thought about the Lord not leaving us, the Lord not uh, ever removing his presence from as long as, it, as God is with us, we won't be afraid. Um, and so this, this thought, I, I know that uh, Rolling Stones has labeled this particular song as a top 500 song of all time. It's actually within the top 200 songs, which I, I was telling Cassandra, I said, I, as I'm looking at this list, I go to number one, and it's a um, Bob Dylan song, like a Rolling Stone, and I, I hate it. I didn't even know that song, you know? But I think it was because in reference of who was writing, uh, the, Rolling, the Rolling Stone magazine put it in the top 500, so they put that one as number one. Um, but it had some type of impact on it. Um, and the reason, why that I, the reason why that I bring that up is because sometimes it, songs bring back some old memories. Sometimes it brings back some thoughts. And so um, I'm thinking about uh, a lot of things that, in which that I would say, you know, before Watonga, before that I moved here, I had a lot of time spent in Tologa, Oklahoma, like small town, U.S say more than small town Watonga USA and so I would say before here there was a life that was spent in Dewey County a, a county over and um, and then I would go from from past to present to where that now I'm in the best place that I could possibly be Amen. Thank you. I'm glad. I was hoping that I get one because I would, I would say either that, that you're either agreeing that I'm in the best place uh, for me or you just like Watonga. 
Bob, which one is it? Yeah, yeah don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I'm, I'm afraid of rejection. Um, so right now, I'm, I'm doing ministry. I'm doing life with you in, in Watonga. And then there is a future. You know, if, I, if it was up to me in my future, I would just say, I just want to stay where, I don't want there to be change. I want to stay where I'm planted, where I, I'm at currently. Uh, but who knows? Who knows what the future holds for all of us, for any of us? Who knows what that, that looks like? And so whenever we get into this Advent series of this, um, this subtitle text of ante Anticipating Christ, my question that I have for myself is that there was somebody at one point that had no, no Christian education. I mean, no story leading up to the story that you and I might have. Now, some of you would say, I, from diapers, I was in church. From diapers, and, and I would say that's, that's my history as, as well. But can I just share something with you? Just because that my diapers were changed in the church doesn't mean my, my Christian education was great. Doesn't mean that I had an ample, ample self-knowledge of who Jesus was. I had a great history. I had a great legacy. I had grandparents that loved the Lord. I had great-grandparents that, that kind of started that history. And I had parents that, that raised me in the church. But that was kind of my legacy until the point that I had to answer for who Christ was for myself. So even though that I was raised in the church doesn't mean that I necessarily had a, a lot of head knowledge of who Jesus was. Was I really anticipating Christ? No, it was basically a providence that was given to me. It was basically this heritage that was handed to me, and at some point in time I had to say, what are you going to do with it? Or the Lord came to me and say, what are you going to do with it for yourself? What saith you, Cason? And so, whenever we anticipate Christ, I know that this is kind of this, this odd question to, to ask, but does Scripture have anything to say to people that had no pre-knowledge of Jesus? Could they have really anticipated Christ? Could they really have anticipated Christ? Um, what were they looking forward to? And Paul kind of answers that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And so if you guys would want to turn there, if you have your Bibles or your apps, uh, open up to, to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. And I'm going to start with uh, verse 3, which I don't have it here on my, uh, on my overhead. So I'm just going to read verse 3 uh, real quick and then I'll... I'll uh, I'm going to start with verse 2. <laughs> verse 2, 2 and 3, and then I'm going to throw it up here on the screen. Paul is talking to people that were not Jewish. They had no heritage. They were like first generation Christ believers. People that just had no idea, had no anticipation. They had no legacy of Christ as far as earthly fathers or forefathers. Okay? None. And so Paul is writing to these people, this church, first generational believers, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Jesus Christ, and called to be holy together with those everyone who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know if this helps you out at all, but did you hear how Paul addresses those people that had no legacy? He's talking about these people that have no legacy, what they're called to. They're called to be holy. They're called to be together. They're called to, to, to call upon the name of Jesus Christ, even if they had no knowledge leading up to it. And this is what he says. I always thank God for you because of his grace given to you in Jesus Christ. For in him you have been enriched in every way. In all your speaking, in all your knowledge, what knowledge? They had no foreknowledge, okay? I, I want you to understand this. And what knowledge? Because of our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, <laughs> you don't lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait. You hear this Advent theme here? As you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. 
He will keep you strong to the end so you will be blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God who has called you into the fellowship with his son Jesus Christ our Lord is faithful. Amen? Amen. Amen. So this is, this is kind of interesting to me as I kind of think, I, I love preaching from the standpoint as if that um, you don't know a thing and I don't know a thing. Like I've got a, a clean slate and if I was to come into a sanctuary on a Sunday morning and I had no pre-knowledge, I, I have to have this thought that there is some of you that kind of identify with me before seminary, before college, before anything, just straight out of college still feeling called to the Lord Jesus Christ but have no foreknowledge no, no, no great foundation if somebody wants to read that and I would just like yeah that sounds good I love, I love preaching from the standpoint of trying to get you as if that you don't know a thing. And I don't mean that in an in insulting way at all. But I think that all of us might have some pre-knowledge, some of us hunger and thirst <laughs> for the goodness, to, for Christ to be revealed. And so I think some of us get to a point whenever we say, I can do this on my own. I can sit in a, in a, in a sanctuary like this or I, I could leave it. I don't need a pastor. I don't need a community of faith. And do you want to know what Paul says to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1? He says, you want to know about your past? You want to know, if you want to know about your future, let's take a look at your past, okay? Um, I got a timeline here for you, okay? And so I'm just going to kind of walk as far as I'm on the past side. Let's talk about your past. If you want to talk about your legacy, if you want to talk about where God has taken you, let's just talk about your past, for, for instance. This is where God's brought you to. One is that grace is applied to you. If you're here today, whether or not that you want to recognize grace or not being in your life, grace is applied to you. You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. There's nothing that you could do to to gain it, but God gave it to you and it's called prevenient grace. He gave it to you and here it is. You didn't deserve it. So you're blessed. God did that. You didn't have to do a thing. Okay? You want to know another thing? We'll talk about just a little bit beyond the presence. He has put you in a community of faith, a learning community that although that you didn't know a thing coming up to this point in time, you weren't even anticipating Christ. Christ came to you even whenever you weren't anticipating him. He came all the way to you. And because of that, you are placed in a learning community. He's talking about that to the, the place of, in Corinth. You are placed in a church together, and you're called to be holy, growing together. You're called to call upon the name of the Lord. You're called to trust Him, and that's what's happened to you. For that matter, you don't have a Jewish heritage. Your hope looked bleak as far as that's concerned. You had it. You, you, were, you were grafted in for that matter. So grace is overwhelming to you. <laughs> Let's talk about how that you are represented right now in this moment, in the present. In the present, am I standing in the middle for most of you? In the present, he has equipped you with every good spiritual work. He's talking to this church that didn't have a heritage. He's talking about grace that came all the way to them and now they're in a learning community and now you don't want to know how they function? Not, ba not based upon a long, rich heritage. Not about a long, rich uh, uh, pre-knowledge of who God was. Not a long, rich of anticipating Christ's coming. No, all of a sudden, they are basking in fields in which they didn't plow. They are reaping a harvest of grace in which that they didn't toil and, and, and do a lot of prophecy or a lot of Bible study for that matter. Grace came to them. And not only that, God has equipped them to be a church. Not Jewish people. These outsiders. These people that didn't have all this heritage. He has equipped them. And this is what it says. It says in, in, in verse um, 5, he says this. You have been enriched in every single single way in all your speaking and all your your uh, knowledge 
And then I'm going to skip down to verse 7. It's in the present. It says, therefore, you don't lack anything. You don't lack any spiritual gifts at all. You can function right now as a church. Can I just pause and, and stop here just for a moment? And I would say that we kind of fit into a couple of categories, and I'm just going to speak to a, a few. For some of us that we come in this relationship with Jesus Christ, and it seems overwhelming. It overwhelms us sometimes because that we would say, you know, where do I start? Some of us are in our 50s and 60s for that matter and we get to a point where we say, you know what? Not that I have anticipated or I was eager or I waited for the Lord, but for all of a sudden in my 50s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, 30s, <laughs> Cassandra, <laughs> uh, not saying this applies to her, but we're saying that all of a sudden the light bulb came on and said, God's grace was there all along. It caught up with me. It's here. Now I feel like I've squandered away the majority of my life. I didn't dive into the word. For that matter, I was drugged to church by a, a good friend of mine or maybe even a husband or a wife drug me to church. And you know, whenever sermons came on, I, my ears came off. Uh, I threw them somewhere. I don't know where they went. I just wasn't paying attention and so therefore, whatever someone was trying to teach me as far as that's concerned, it just didn't land or didn't sink in or I wasn't really that intentional about it. And so here I am in my older life in which that I had been given every opportunity. And all of a sudden, I just, I feel like I've got a lot of catching up to do. And it discourages us to the point to where we would say, oh well, oh well. I guess I'm just going to live life with whatever I had and I'm going to go on this <laughs> magic carpet ride we call grace and we're going to coast the rest of the way because grace caught up with me. But I think that there's a better way. I think this is a better way because even for those Gentile people that start a church, that, that, come, that the light finally came on, uh, whether it's in their, their, their short past or in their present present, that they would say, I'm depending upon my learning community that he has graced me with. And not only that, that he has given us every spiritual gift to behave and act and do this life together. Together as one. To call to be holy. And, and bits by bits by bits, maybe not in its fullness, but bits by bits by bits, Christ starts getting revealed. And it gets me excited. It gets my socks rolling up and down. Because I live in a community together. If pastor was not part of my title, this is, this is part of the, the issue that I think that we have. We have this employee-employer hierarchy thought and even the consumerism aspect of it to where we say, if I'm not getting it, then something's wrong with the church. If I'm not getting it, something is wrong with the people because they're not feeding me. Do you want to know something? Whenever I read this first chapter in the book of Corinthians, you want to know something that never comes to my mind? I don't think, I'm absolutely positive that that thought never crossed their minds. That th thought was not, I'm going to blame the church for not getting what I need to get. I think there was a lot of self-responsibility because whenever Paul says, you've been enriched in every way. Listen, do you hear yourself here? You, go ahead, put your name there. You, Kaysen, have been enriched in every way. You, James, have been enriched in every way. You, Tyler, have been enriched in every single way. 
You, Dr. Betts, have been enriched in every single way. And not only that, you've been equipped with every spiritual gift in a community of faith. You got, you got no excuse. You cannot blame anybody else. God has come all the way to you. Amen? Okay? So, I'll get off that soapbox and let me just move from past to present to future here is that I think that whenever we look at the future, you want to know what I'm assuming that happens for you whenever I say, think about your future. Um, we got some college students here. We got some just recently graduated college students here and, and uh, we have some that have maybe even pretty heavy physical diagnoses in their lives. And when I say, think about your future, you want to know what probably rises up a little bit? Anxiety. Worry. And so, whenever I... Whenever I do some research and I go to Amazon.com or, or do some research in which the, all the statistics in which that they are accessible to, they created these tablets called Kindle and they have some applications on there. You want to know what the most underlined, highlighted verse that is in the Bible app in Kindle? Kindle Fire, whatever those might be. Philippians 4, 6. It says, don't be anxious about anything. I wonder why that, that's the most highlighted, the most underlined verse. It's probably not, I'm not saying that it's the most read, but in their statistics, they would say that's the most looked after, sought after one. It's because I think that a couple of weeks ago, whenever we were in our giant series and, and we, had, uh, we had looked at this uh, giant of fear, and God says multiple, multiple times, um, don't fear, do not be afraid, that I think that God was concerned about our fear because he knew that whenever we would look to our future, we would think, what does that even look like? Fear would rise up. And there again, I think it comes back to this, this whole Stand By Me song. Stand By Me. I think some of you need to hear this, okay? Whenever you get to your future, you want to know who's already there waiting? God. And that's why that I think that he says, because we don't live in the future, but we serve a God that, is in, that, is, that has been active in our past, that is active in our present, and has already seen our future. And so whenever you arrive, I think you just need to hear this. I think, that, I think anxiety begins to be dis diminished whenever we recognize that we serve a God, that whenever we show up in our future, God's already there. It says, therefore, you don't lack any spiritual gifts as you eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. You know, I had... Uh, there are certain gifts that I think that I, I operate in. Um, I've, I've talked to a few of you and you, you've said, you know, I just don't want to do that. Uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to pray out loud. That's just not my spiritual gift. But it doesn't negate from the fact that we're all called to pray, right? Um, scripture also says, eagerly desire the gifts. Um, some of you are great at hospitality. Um, some of you either desire to be uh, very, very hospitable, and so you really work at that. And some of you are just naturally good at hospitality, and God has equipped you as, as part of the body of believers to operate and exercise those gifts. Some of you give like crazy. Some of you, it's, it's like if, if you run across an inheritance that, or for that matter, that you've got this idea of what the Gentiles believers did in Corinth, Corinth, you come across a grace that you didn't work with your own two hands and you recognize this as a, as a blessing, you can't help but to just give. 
For some of you, I know some of you don't have... Um, well, I just don't want to use that for terminology that I grew up with. A pot, you know. <laughs> you guys didn't have it. But even if you had it, you would give it away. You know what I'm saying? You're just great at giving. And some of you, and some would say, you're not very good with your money because you just give your stuff away and you're just thinking, this is just how I'm equipped. I'm really glad that my parents aren't here today because I, th I just really think I would get a lecture and they'd probably get it on Facebook here after a while. Uh, and I'll probably get a text here in a little bit. But I, I would think this would, this is not the way that I was raised at all. If I, if I am going on a trip or a vacation, I have a tendency to not finish my packing until the last moment. Now, I've let my parents know there are certain trips that I go on and probably a month out, my mom, um, she's a great mom. She would say, have you started packing yet? And I, I kind of, I know her, I know that she would pack months in advance because the whole idea is you can't, you shouldn't forget anything because you have no excuse, right? But it doesn't matter the logic behind it, I'm, I'm packing at the last moment. And it just drives some people crazy. You probably have anxiety, you OCD people have anxiety just letting me, me tell you that, right? Um, <clears throat> but I just have to wait to the last moment. And some of you would say, well, you do, for, do you forget anything? And I would say, absolutely, I forget stuff all the time. If I go to the Philippines, it's probably going to be the night before that I finish packing, and it's probably not smart of me to do that. But here's the thing, and I, I've said this over and over again. Um, I, must, I must think that this is some great wisdom because Jimmy uses it, and I was just like, yeah, that w I said that. He, sa he says this all the time. Kaysen says this all the time. God has packed your bag. And he didn't wait for the last moment to do it. God has equipped you to do everything and we, are, we don't have to blame anybody. We don't have to blame the church. We can just say, you know what? God has graced me with the church, with a learning community. And whenever I say, just because that I've got a title of pastor, Cassandra and I have this conversation all the time. Where would we go if we didn't have a church? If we didn't have the title, and I would, and, and we always come to the same conclusion, Cassandra. If you would help me out just by supporting me in, in these conversations that we had, just do this. And she's over here, so you know. So be looking at her when I say this, okay? It's not me just throwing out fluff. I would want to go and be a learning community with the Watonga Church of the Nazarene. We say that, don't we? We say that because I believe that we do it with intent, that we wrestle, we don't always get it right. We sometimes blame each other, but I think that, I think that there's casualties along the way. But I think that there's hope that is rising whenever we can overcome and we look to the person that has equipped us for every good work. Whenever we eagerly desire the gifts that, that we haven't been given, but we eagerly desire them. And we don't just use excuses by saying, God, it's just not, it's just not how you pack my bag. Obviously, it might not be the way that you pack the church's bag for that matter. But you want to know we have to look to something else in finale. We look to the table because these people that in Corinth, these first generational believers that are saying, I've got a learning community, my bag is packed, it's, I don't lack a thing, and as I eagerly anticipate even something better, we do it together. That we look to a table that represents Christ's broken body and his spilt blood that unifies us, that, that makes us think it's all about him. It's not about us. It's not about the grace that we earned, that we mustered up. 
Because whenever I think for some of us that think about our future, I think the highest amount of fear, the highest anxiety that we have, especially coming to church, think about the conversations that you've had with people that say, I don't think that I'm ready to come. A lot of times their excuses will point towards people but a majority of the time they would just be saying, I am just not good enough yet. A majority of them would say, I haven't got my stuff in order. And the truth of the matter is for these people in Corinth, that wasn't even in their conversation either. It wasn't a part of their conversation for them to say, Grace came all the way to me. I didn't have any forethought or I I didn't get my stuff together. For that matter, all my stuff was all... I tried to pack my own bag and you want to know what it looked like? (laughs) It's all wrinkled and I didn't even put the stuff that I needed in there for that matter. But whenever Christ came all the way to me, He equipped me. Christ came all the way to you. Christ already equipped you to do the the work that is set before you. That anxiety of I gotta get it all together shouldn't even be in, in your conversation. That we come with a past. God was working even in the midst of our mess ups. In our present, God has has graced you and you can live in the the knowledge that he has given you grace and you operate in in in, in function in the mentality that God has given you everything that you need for a life of holiness right now. You don't have to try to figure out what happened last year, the last five years, the last 30 years. Start now. And for your future, if you start right now, and even if you don't start right now, you want to know who's meeting you there in the future? God's already there. And so he comes to you. If we can have some ushers come forward, we're going to take communion. I'm going to ask the Hope group to come up and and they're going to to play one more song and sing and, and lead us in this moment of coming to the table. It's nothing that we have done to deserve any of this. God came all the way to us and so our ushers are gonna come all the way to you and you're going to eagerly anticipate and you're going to wait in hospitality for others to be served 